Good morning. Welcome to our first Utah Campus Safety Conference. My name's Keith Squires, and I have the privilege of serving as the Chief Safety Officer for the University of Utah. I'm excited to welcome you all as our partners in developing the best ways to keep our college and university campuses safe. Our job is unique and complex. We are responsible for making these beautiful and vast public spaces safe for learning, working, attending events, and sometimes for patient care. Families from around the world entrust their most precious people to us. Children, parents, siblings, friends, and our loved ones. We strive every day to create places of welcome and belonging while keeping the dangers of our society out. It's a complicated profession, but our peace officers and other members of our public safety teams are committed to serving our campus communities. Today, we will share information and talk about how we can continually improve, implementing the most up-to-date evidence-based safety practices to create safe and secure environments for our students and broader campus communities. Dr. Jill McCluskey will deliver our keynote address. I'm grateful for her ongoing commitment to helping us, helping all of us, to be able to find ways to improve safety for students. Thank you. Our breakout sessions include discussions about demystifying federal laws governing firearms possession and campus and opioid overdose deaths, resisting cyber attacks, responses to, recent, to a recent series of bomb threats that we've experienced here at the U, a panel discussion about behavioral intervention teams and trends in active shooter events, as well as others. Some of these conversations are difficult. We have faced tragedies and controversies, and that's happened on many of our campuses. But we have learned from these experiences, and we will keep moving forward with purpose. We will need to feel safe. It's a basic human need and I look forward to collaborating with all of you as we work to improve campus safety across this great state. So now I'd like to introduce you to the University of Utah's Department of Public Safety team. In the years since our wonderful student athlete, Lauren McCluskey was murdered on campus, our public safety team has been working hard to make meaningful changes in how we approach and deliver our public safety services, including going back to the name and intent of safety operations that was identified when our department was created in 1970. More than 90% of this team are new to the U in the past few years. And those that are here from before are those who are definitely leading and helping us make changes that need to happen. We've recently opened a new public safety building that was specifically designed to help our team provide the best safety services possible to our community. It also includes a state-of-the-art dispatch center, emergency management space, and a soft victim survivor room that uh, is for a specific purpose and is something that is long overdue. We now have two victim survivor advocates in our public safety building who work with all of our team and are available to our campus community 24 seven. And finally, we are advised by the staff of the McCluskey Center for Violence Prevention, an education and research institute named after Lauren McCluskey that focuses on the prevention rather than campus safety and response operations. 
During its three-year history, the McCluskey Center has engaged thousands of students, staff, and faculty on our campus, in our state, and nationally. In educational workshops that help participants develop better understanding of the roots of harm and how to interrupt harmful behavior. This is work that is never done. Our university community impacted again, was impacted again by interpersonal violence a year ago when first year student Jifan Dong was murdered by a man she had dated. We honor both Jifan and Lauren by talking about their lives, acknowledging what could have been done better and sharing their stories so that others can learn as well. Transparency is our path forward. We were recently invited by the university's communication team to explain our changes and our philosophy here at the Department of Public Safety. And we appreciate being able to share a video with you this morning that resulted from their interviews. There is nothing more important to the U's new Department of Public Safety than the safety of me and my fellow students and the rest of the campus community. While that has always been job number one for DPS, major improvements were required to sharpen that focus. It took restructuring, rethinking, and retraining. The way we are doing things now is because of what we learned from what existed a few years ago when Lauren was murdered here on campus. And there were failures, and that's what uh, our findings were, and that's what uh, drove our recommendations. These difficult findings required DPS to make a fundamental change. In the past, with victims of crime, we've kind of focused our attention on getting the cases prepared for court. What we've done is we've kind of switched that around. We've actually put the victims at the center of our investigation. We don't want them to have to relive what they went through. All of our detectives are trained on trauma-informed interviewing, and they are trained on the signs of trauma, the impact that trauma has on somebody, and how to recognize those signs in a victim. Now, victims of crime are never left alone through the legal process. They have a victim advocate to stand by them. Our department has become very trauma-informed and victim-centered. So our concentration is on what the victim wants and what the victim needs. Now we have someone that can stand by them, sit with them, help them through that process, and then if their case goes to court, can sit with them in court and support them through the criminal justice system. New training procedures were put in place that zero in on the kinds of situations that can arise on campus. We're very fortunate to get the amount of training that the university provides for us, like the interpersonal violence training, stalking training, domestic violence training. When they do come up on campus, they're very important that we handle these cases right and having them victims in mind. One of the big changes to DPS is the goal to substantially increase the number of female officers to better relate to students. Well, like me. Here at the University of Utah, what we've tried to implement is 30% of our police officers be female by the year 2030. Here on campus, a lot of the cases that we have, they involve female victims. And having a female be the first person to come take a report with them, having a female detective, it's actually been something that we have shown success in. They have what we call a soft area, but it's really just a comfortable space for people who have experienced trauma to have to share that information. It's very hard, but this makes it easier. Part of improving is always getting feedback and being held accountable for actions, both bad and good. From the Guardian tracking software system, we have a professional standards department, and we can conduct those investigations using the Guardian tracking system for complaints and compliments, and then take care of those problems before they become a bigger problem. But we can also recognize officers for going above and beyond. Making campus safer was a core goal of new university president, Taylor Randall. Having closer lines of communication to DPS was central. One of the best things about what we're doing and the support that we have is that when the university created the chief safety officer's position, they made it uh, a part of the president's cabinet. The process of getting us to where we're at today and where we're going 
Um, this department really is driven by leadership, leadership of the university and investment into public safety. That can be seen in many ways. One of the recommendations we made was a new building, not just to have a new building, but to be able to design it in a way that it can effectively serve our university community. Dispatch, they are a vital unit to the police department. Without them, we wouldn't be able to find out what's going on. They are the ones who kind of quarterback everything here with DPS. The design of the building, uh, the dispatch center is state of the art. The new building is a vital new addition to DPS, but what goes on inside that building and how its officers and team work is also vital and under independent review. So the independent review committee, which is the IRC, is comprised of faculty, staff, and students. And it's a committee that basically reviews all of our complaints. It is comprised of people independent from the Department of Public Safety. It shows that we're transparent. I believe in transparency. There's hard questions and there's hard answers, but there's always an answer. It takes a certain kind of person to be a part of DPS. Dedicated, community-minded, caring, responsive. And as DPS has refilled its ranks, the hiring process has been extremely thorough. Over the last three years, this department, it has turned over significantly. We are doing investigations right. I think all police officers come into this profession and they want to help, you know, do better. And so I think that was uh, my main goal in becoming a police officer. Getting feedback from students, faculty, and staff is one of the key measures for us to be able to be transparent, understand where we can get better. We would encourage anybody to take those avenues to connect with us, to let us know what your concerns are and where we can be helpful. The best part right now is the fact that uh, everybody's coming together and as one team. So we've been able to restructure this department so that uh, instead of just having a police department doing their thing, a security division doing theirs, um, emergency management covering their functions. We're all together under the umbrella of the Department of Public Safety. And it is the bringing together of all these functions and resources under one roof that has affected positive change. And helps to make campus a safer place for all of us. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce University of Utah President Taylor Randall. Taylor Randall is the 17th president of the University of Utah. He joined the U in 1998 as a professor of accounting and led the nationally ranked David Eccles School of Business for 12 years prior to his appointment as president in 2021. The first alum in 50 years to hold this position President Randall has an infectious energy and passion for his alma mater. He has set a bold goal for the University of Utah to become a top 10 public university with unsurpassed societal impact. He believes that you can revolutionize the student experience, change lives through research, and have an impact on all 3.4 million Utahns. I would like to add on a personal note, President Randall is a passionate advocate for all that we're doing. Sir, there's not often a day goes by that you're not checking to see how things are going and see what support we need. And along with the rest of your team and administration, we are very fortunate. It's my privilege to introduce our president, Taylor Randall. Well, good morning and welcome to this uh, conference. We're certainly honored to host you all. It is my pleasure to introduce doc, uh, Dr. Jill McCluskey as our keynotes, keynote speaker today. As you know, Dr. Jill McCluskey is the mother of Lauren McCluskey, the honors student athlete who was murdered in 2018 at the age of 21 on this University of Utah campus. So before I introduce Dr. McCluskey, I'd like to share a few brief remarks. Jill, I want you to know that the University of Utah will always mourn Lauren's death and we will forever keep her memory alive. 
Lauren's murder was a tragic event and a defining moment for this university. We have learned from it, and we must continue to learn from it. We've applied those lessons, and we will continue to improve. One way, impro one way we improve is to honor Lauren's legacy by telling her story. We've made substantial changes, as you've seen, since Lauren's death to improve safety of our campus and to serve as an example to others. Among other improvements, we've reimagined and reinvented our public safety department, created racist and bias incident response teams to investigate complaints, and established a new reporting system for dating violence, stalking, and other crimes. Our sincere desire is to set a national standard for safety practices at a public university, and that desire is foundational to everything we do. It is our dedication to transparency that shines a light just on us, on where we've been, but on where we need to go. And we will continue to shine the light of transparency. So with this background, let me introduce Jill McCluskey. Jill and her husband, Matt, founded the Lauren McCluskey Foundation with a primary mission of improving campus safety and a focus on the response to victims. Jill's presence here today is a testament to the enduring strength of our relationship with her, her husband, Matt, and their family foundation. May I add just personally, it has been a pleasure to get to know you, to understand what drives your, you in this quest for improving our campuses, and I would just wanna thank you personally. Jill is a Regents Professor and Director of the School of Economic Sciences at Washington State University. She holds a PhD from UC Berkeley. At the foundation, Jill's main focus is on campus safety, and she is also supportive of the foundation's two additional strategic objectives, dealing with am amateur athletes and animal welfare, which were two of Lauren's passions. She is collaborating with us on the Campus Safety Score Initiative. Of particular note, Jill started Lauren's Promise, a campaign which is, which is a reminder, it's a promise that we, will, that we all take to do three things for our students. Those three things are listen and believe if someone is threatening you, represent a safe haven for sharing incidents of sexual assault, domestic violence, or stalking, and three, change campus culture that responds poorly to dating violence and stalking. Jill shares Lauren's story to increase awareness of the danger of dating violence to make positive change so others will not lose their daughters to violence. Today, Jill will provide insights into the critical interactions, campus students, staff and faculty, from safety personnel to housing managers and resident assistants, how they have with victims and how those conversations can make a difference. Please join me in wel welcoming Dr. Jill McCluskey. Well, thank you all so much for, for inviting me here. Uh, thank you to the Department of Public Safety. Thank you to Keith Squires, uh, just for all the changes you've made. I, I, see, I see it all, and it, it means so much to me. I see so much sincerity and just authenticity and willingness to to, to make change and that, that takes courage and it, it takes caring of the individuals. I've met, so, I've met so many of you here already and I hope to meet more of you who, are, who have the correct motivations to, to help and it just means so much. Uh, also thank you to um, Kimberly, Kimberly Burnett for all the support that she did to get me out here and, uh, and also I'll mention that my, um, Lauren's roommate, Alex Mumphrey, who is a, um, she's a graduate of the U and uh, she's, out, she's out in the lobby with the table for the, for the foundation. So first let me, let me tell you about my daughter, Lauren. So Lauren, uh, Lauren was, Lauren was beautiful. She was sensitive. She was, she cared about others. Uh, in this 
middle bottom picture right here, that's her in high school. She was a state champion in the high jump. She got second in the hurdles at the state meet twice. So she was a hardworking athlete. She was an honor student. Uh, she cared about animals and she volunteered for the Humane Society. That's, that's her in the middle top. And she wanted cats to be, she wanted to help socialize cats so they would be more adoptable. Uh, she was so excited to compete for the U. She was so uh, proud of her teammates and, uh, and just wanted to be the best athlete and student that she could be. So here she is doing hurdles and doing high jump at the U. Uh, she, also, she also attended church. This is a picture of her with her church youth group on a, on a, a hiking trip. Uh, she she would invite her friends to go to church and would just she loved to sing and that was one place where she would just belt out the hymns and sing and uh, and wanted people to sing with her. Uh, she was she was going to graduate and uh, she had a she had a three point seven seven GPA. So an honor student there. She um, here she is. In the summer before she graduated, she was she was a communication major, and she was uh, she was shadowing a um, a newscaster. Uh, she also in this she she was a she did an internship at her grandparents' uh, uh, living community, and uh, she interviewed all the residents at the community and wrote stories about them and made a picture directory. So she was the communication intern for her parent, grandparents' retirement community. But then uh, she, wanted, she wanted to, she did, she wanted to have a boyfriend and she met, she met a man who was really an evil man who lied to her about his name, his age, and his criminal history and fooled her for a while and he was a manipulative um, con man, really. She did figure it out within a month. He met her in September, and he killed her in October. And so on, on October 22nd, 2018, she was killed by this man who she dated as she came home from her night class. She was on the phone with me, walking home, telling me about her class when she was killed. And so from this, we must all take action. And I, I want to tell Lauren's story so that people think of that when they, when they are interacting with, with victims. Uh, so one of my first, as, as President Randall was saying, one of my first uh, responses to this was, what could I have done as a professor if another student, if it, this happened to another student? And so my idea was Lauren's promise and that's, I will listen and believe you with someone's threatening you. And uh, I thought I could put this on my course syllabus and, and that would invite uh, someone to, that would invite uh, someone who's being stalked or threatened that they could come to me. And, and I feel often I have a stronger voice as a professor. More people are willing to listen to me and take action. I, can, I, I might be better able to convey the seriousness of the situation. And we've had um, professors at over, at least one professor at over 200 universities that have made this promise. And I've heard many stories about how, how it has been effective. And they're often anonymous because, because of the privacy that's involved, but, but it's, it's making a difference. And we're trying to keep, we're, the, our foundation is trying to create a better database of people who are willing to stand up and say, I've made Lauren's promise. And it, it also is beyond, um, Universities now, we invite anyone to make Lauren's Promise. So people at dance studios, for example, say, I make, I make Lauren's Promise. And we have stickers and we have uh, cards that you can sign that, are, that you could take your picture with out in, out in the lobby with Sharpies if you, if you want to do that. Uh, so we also started the Lauren McCleskey Foundation. Uh, we have some strategic initiatives for campus safety. Number one is to increase awareness of the seriousness of dating violence and stalking. And so that's that's one thing that I'm trying to do right now. And when I talk to when I talk to groups, I I try to in, just increase the knowledge. I, before before we lost Lauren, I didn't know about the seriousness myself. Number two, we want to uh, expand the adoption of Lauren's promise, and that's synergistic with the first 
point in that if more people adopt Learn's Promise, they, they understand the seriousness of the situation. We also want to work with uh, experts to create best practices blueprint for, for an effective response, and we've been, we've been working on that. Uh, our fourth is to develop and distribute a campus safety score, and I'll talk about that a little bit more today. And then finally, share our resources to strengthen um, dating violence and stalking loss. So then uh, we did learn a lot from Lauren's case. What did we learn? Uh, we learned that coordination and communications are needed and I have, no, I have no silos. We don't want, we need everyone to talk. So in Lauren's case, and, and note I'm not, being, I'm not being critical here. I just, I want to, it's, I'm pointing these out partly to show all the changes that have been made. You guys are amazing. But uh, in Lauren's case, there was no coordination and communication. Uh, university housing didn't communicate with the police. The campus security didn't communicate with police. And there was no communication across police juris jurisdiction, jurisdictions. And also, to our knowledge, there was no communication between counseling and police. Uh, second, timely responses are needed. If someone takes days off, a backup person needs to cover the cases and respond with, uh, with urgency. Further, um, the, we need to have access to a victim's advocate, and that should be offered. And I love, I love seeing that in the video, and I've heard about that before, that, that, that Keith uh, Squires has, has implemented that right away. The lethality assessment program should be used, and that might have identified Lauren as, as at risk for domestic violence homicide. And then finally, there must be a culture that believes women. And research shows that if there are more female officers, women are more likely to report crime. So I love the goal of 30% of 30 in the future. Then so I also, I also started thinking about this just with, with Lauren's case and that just like there, I, I thought of this when there was a um, Air Flyers Bill of Rights and I was thinking, how about a campus safety Bill of Rights? And what that is, that was, this is just my idea that, that first there's a statement that any form of sexual harassment or violence uh, will not be excused or tolerated. No excuses for this. Um, if victims report sexual harassment, violence th threats, uh, it will be documented, investigated, reported, and responded to in a timely manner. Uh, and victims will be treated with respect, dignity, and that includes being interviewed in a private room. So it's the soft interview rooms are wonderful. Uh, further, campus police need to need to uh, direct victims to resources and assistance, and that might include uh, that might include counseling and uh, and victims advocates. And then, campus uh, campus housing staff need to respond and act within 24 hours. So just just um, they need to be timely. And then finally, that victims should have the right to ban someone who's threatening or harassing them from trespassing on the campus uh, and their living arrangements or, or a building. And then just one more thing. This is, I read this in the conversation and this made me think more about how, how we can better respond to victims. And this is, this is from this, this article, but that first, of course, you need to comply with the law. Second, respond sensitively to victim disclosure and do not blame the victim. And I, as the mother of a victim, I have had so much victim blaming, it's shocking. You know, and I can't believe that, you know, some, that people would do that. And I still get, I report them to our, lo our local campus police have had to respond a number of times for people who have harassed me just because of, of my daughter. And it's, it's shocking, but it happens. Uh, we need to uh, listen to victims and be accountable for mistakes. We might make a mistake, but be accountable for it and apologize when it's appropriate. That goes a long way. Then cherish the whistleblower who raises these uncomfortable truths. And if you know, hear about a problem, you can, you can take steps to correct it. Uh, next, um, engage in self-study. And I think I see you guys doing that all the time. How can we make, how can you do better? and conduct anonymous surveys, and then ensure that leadership is educated about research on violence, on sexual violence and related trauma, and I know that that's true here. Uh, next, be transparent with data and policy, so that, and that's what Keith is doing all the time. 
and and then um, we can also use the power of the university to address some of these societal problems. And that's what that's exactly what Chris Linder is doing with the McCleskey Center for Violence Prevention. And then and then commit resources. And I see that you're doing that here. So uh, all these I think all these things are important. But with all that you're doing, there is still a challenge. And and I, I put this slide up just to say that uh, when we're working with students here with some of our races and things like that, even though so much change has happened, there's still there's still some distrust of the students. I, you personally have my trust, but there's still some distrust of the students. And, and sometimes it seems like the students do not want the police there. And so there's there's um, there's work to be done. And there's sometimes there's a lagged reaction response to to this trust. So that's something that that's that's difficult and a challenge that 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 um, we need to figure out. One thing that I um, and I haven't promoted this or anything, but I thought about this that maybe there's a law enforcement promise, and I'm not proposing this or anything, but this is something that we can think about. That just is saying that I will treat you with respect and dignity. I will res I will investigate with urgency and protect you if someone's threatening you. So sort of like Lauren's promise, except what the what the um, law enforcement say. And I realize it's probably too long, but uh, but I was just thinking of how can we overcome that trust issue, which is a challenge. So then uh, I wanted to think about how we can use these ideas and in, in what we've learned from, from Lauren's case, how can we use that to cre create incentives for universities to be safer? And so, so I'm an economist, and I had this idea that um, that we that we would want to um, create a um, campus safety score or ranking, and and we've already talked with uh, had some preliminary discussions with U.S. News and, and World Reports who do who do some of the main rankings, and and they're open to this. They're open to including something like this, and so what we want to do with this is to uh, create a ranking or a score that, that will incentivize universities to adopt best practices, procedures, and policies so that they can, that they can do the best for their students. And, and then at the same time, students can, students can look at that ranking and that can help them choose a university to, so to choose the safest one. Um, so what might go into this? It might be um, the issue, uh, it might be that we might evaluate some of their policies and procedures such that, um, is there a coordinated campus response? I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, what, do they have best practices in police training and procedures? Is there, um, so for example, are they using the lethality ass assessment program? Uh, is there community input? Are you listening to what the community and the students want? And is there transparency? Uh, also, I. Adoption of Lauren's Promise might be one because how what percentage of the faculty voluntarily adopt Lauren's Promise? Are there are there victim services? Is there a victim's advocate on staff in the police force? Then the campus climate. So is there a, a awareness of the seriousness of um, of dating violence? Are there how many police? How many um, what percentage of police officers are female? For example. Uh, and then also in the, are there violence prevention programs? So, um, so is there in-person ongoing educational programs for students in violence prevention? Uh, and then in this, thinking about the coordinated campus response, just going a little deeper on that one point, this, um, what this means is that the response is not limited to um, campus police, it includes housing, it includes other police jurisdictions, it includes professors, it includes counseling. So it includes all these things. And we all, we all need to make, we all need to help. Uh, and I, I will acknowledge that um, the housing team failed in Zifang uh, Dong's case, and we're, we're all, we're all um, sad over that. Uh, and then I also wanted to bring up the point of counseling. So, and and with that, I think this needs further research. So Lauren saw her U counselor twice after breaking up with her murderer on October 15th at 10.30 p.m. And then she called a police officer an hour later 
and the appointments are one hour. And then on the day she was murdered on October 22nd, she had an appointment at 11 a.m. She called the same police officer at 11.55. And so, so uh, my questions would be, did she call the police from the counselor's office? What is the best practices um, if uh, Lauren told the counselor about her concerns? And so we can't really look at this because counseling records are sealed and we can't learn from Lauren's case in this situation, but it's something I think that needs, that needs further evaluation. Um, and that there's no, no accountability from the counselor side. So that after Lauren was murdered, the police were evaluated, housing was evaluated, the counseling was not even when there was a murder took place right after the meeting. And so, so it's, something, it's something that we should think about what are best practices in counseling and I understand why they're sealed. You, um, it can prevent, um, if they were not sealed, it might cause LGBTQ uh, students to not go to counseling. But on the other side, if after a crime, you're able to analyze that, it might create better best practices and save lives of further victims. So then another, we've talked about the input data. Let's talk about the out, outcome data or measures. In terms of campus safety data, there's, we already have the Clary Act. Um, some concerns with the Clary Act data is that it's um, often it's, it's lagged, so it takes a while for it to get there. It's underreported, and universities may misclassify. So this is just this is not directed at the, at the U at all. It's directed at all universities that this is, this is an issue. Another thing to consider is um, surrounding neighborhood crime data. So you can get FBI crime data. And um, so you might consider a university that is in, um, like say Johns Hopkins in Baltimore is a high crime area. And um, that you, know, you would need to consider the, the background um, crime, but then it can be mitigated by the uh, policies, procedures, and climate of the, of the campus police. And then finally, um, this data on students' perceptions. So awareness of resources, trust in the campus police, and perceptions of safety. And then this can be collected with, with um, surveys. And then finally, um, for, for any kind of measure like this, we need, to, uh, we need to keep it honest. And so there's a need for um, third, some kind of third party auditing system. Uh, to verify that the data is reported and correctly classified. And so just, just like with when you uh, file your income tax return, there's a little threat that you might get audited. And so that, that helps keep it honest. And this rewards universities for correctly reporting and it um, builds trust with students and their parents. And so, so this is still an active, an active project. And so I would, um, I'm really, we have all these great minds here, and uh, I would love it if you would um, share your ideas. And so this idea of the wisdom of crowds, that, that this whole group will have better ideas than just me or some other expert or an, or an expert. And so we have um, an online forum to submit ideas at our, at our Lauren McCluskey Foundation website that you can submit to, and we'd appreciate that. Then I also want to thank the people who are working on the um, campus safety score. So uh, President Randall has a, has a fantastic team and we've gotten a good start with that and at, here at the U and we have experts in um, rankings and in police and violence prevention. I'm also working with um, Mark Duggan at Stanford University and he's an economist there. Um, he's on our Laura McCluskey Foundation board and he's focused on economics and data sources. And then at, at my own university, WSU, I'm working with my colleague, uh, Ron Middlehammer from economics and Michael Gaffney, and he's a um, public safety policy guy. And we're conducting, um, just conducting some student surveys and, and trying to look at all, all the literature that's available on this topic. And so, so with that, I just wanna thank, thank you and, and uh, I want to thank you for all the progress. I want to thank everyone who, is, who has joined the U uh, in this effort to, to make changes and make things better. And, uh, and it means so much to me that 
that this actually helps me in my grief that I see that I see all the changes here and I and I hope that uh, I hope that it will continue and I'm confident that it will with the outstanding leadership so thank you all I'm not sure if you want me to answer questions now or not. Okay. Any questions? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Jill. As always, your thoughtful insight has guided us in the past and will continue to. We would not have made the improvements and we have a lot to do ahead of us, so thank you again. And I wanna mention also, um, you touched on uh, coordinated campus response. The purpose of this conference, um, and we hope to be able to continue it ongoing really is representative of everyone who's in this room. It's not just the police, it's not just housing, it's all of us that have opportunities if we can coordinate and work together to really make a difference in how the outcomes are. And we all know from what we do, um, what a challenging time in life it is as you are at the ages you are as you attend here, um, with the influences that uh, there are in this day and age. But uh, it's truly because of all of us being able to come together to brainstorm and uh, find better ways to do things that will make a difference in the future. So I appreciate my team and I appreciate all of you being here today. Uh, now it's time to move to our first breakout sessions, which begin at 1010. So you'll have a little bit of time to visit and, and uh, catch up with uh, acquaintances that you don't get a chance to see very often. <laughs>